And joining us now, Grant McCracken. He is research affiliate with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the author of a new book called Chief Culture Officer. Good to have you here at TVO again. Thanks for having I me, I saw Steve. you many, many years ago here, and now <laughs> you're back. I am. Well, I, you know, we've all heard of the CEO and the CFO, but you're talking about a new mm. thing here, a chief culture officer. Mm. Let's just do a little background. Why do you think corporations need a better understanding of culture to begin with? Mm. A corporation now finds itself uh, uh, buffeted on every side by the sheer turbulence and dynamism and churn of contemporary culture. These, uh, because it doesn't have a systematic way of understanding culture, uh, these things uh, strike it as kind of blindside hits. Uh, one of Schwartz says that the American, North American corporation lives in a state of perpetual surprise because the world is changing around it constantly. Uh, it's very good at many things, keeping track of changes in finance and technology and operations, but it doesn't have a systematic way of thinking or keeping track of culture. So I would think that would be a surprise to most people because I thought if you're successful in business, you've got to understand the trends that are going on out there anyway, don't you? Well, I think the, the, the uh, corporation is still governed by the assumptions of economics, the problem-solving uh, mechanics of, of economics, and, and those exclude. You know, when you think about Adam Smith, his contribution to the world was to say, let's just ignore the social and the cultural and concentrate on individuals narrowly defined engaged in, in the exchange of value. So this tries to kind of, a CCO approach, uh, tries to put back in the stuff that Smith took out. So we know we hire CEOs, we know we hire CFOs, you now want us to hire CCOs. Right. To do what? To keep track of contemporary culture, and not just the trends and the kind of the, the, the flavors of the moment, but the deeper foundations of that decide what people care about, what they want for their lives, and, and that help make the corporation a vivid, animated presence in contemporary culture instead of this kind of cool hunting, um, sneaky operation that looks for opportunities for manipulation. Okay, I, I can see some people saying this is getting a, you know, Grant, this is getting a little touchy-feely for me right now because <laughs> we know executives make decisions and financial people keep their eye on, yeah. you know, the numbers. Yes. And some companies are adding chief environmental officers because right. we understand the importance of that. Right. But chief cultural officer could feel a bit touchy-feely. Is this a hard sell out there? Yeah, it is a hard sell. I think that's chiefly because we haven't had a systematic way to understand culture. I think once we begin to approach it as we do all of the things the corporation cares about, it'll become easier to think about it and it'll feel less like a soft science. Um, and one of the things I guess we're hoping for is that we'll get, you know, the corporation runs on metrics. Nothing matters unless you can count it and track it. Um, and hopefully we'll see cultural metrics emerge. Uh, presumably good companies already have somebody who does this job but not necessarily with this title, is that fair to say? Indeed. Somebody inside or somebody outside. So sometimes they're calling on the so-called cool hunter or the guru from without to supply some, to tell them what the latest moment is. And the trouble with this guru model is that uh, cool hunters, gurus are always kind of concerned with the latest thing. They define themselves by wearing fantastically cool glasses and wearing Prada head to toe. <laughs> uh, so what they can't tell you about are the deeper foundations of culture. And sometimes that's the stuff you really need to know about. My hunch is the one guy everybody thinks about is Steve Jobs from Apple. Absolutely. He's the, he's the chief, I mean, he's obviously the boss of the company, yeah. but he seems to be their chief culture officer as well. Totally. Anybody do better than him? No, I don't think so. In fact, he's so good at reading culture, he now fashions it, which is uh, the yet, state of the art. He's not head to toe in Prada, though, is he? I mean, he's no. a very uncool guy <laughs> from that respect. No, absolutely not. But he has this standing as a guru. When you say, Steve, so how did you design the iPhone? Um, he'll say, well, you know, we, we thought about it long and hard, but finally it's just an expression of my genius. <laughs> and that's not enough for certain persons. So it means if, God forbid, um, Jobs gets hit by a bus, the corporation is suddenly deprived of the intelligence on which it depends to make its way in the world. But tell me, I hope I got this story right, that I, remember, that I think I remember reading in the book. All of what he achieved may not have happened unless he'd gotten bored with going to post-secondary education, cutting out and just yeah. auditing a course that was yeah. of interest to him? Yeah. You want to tell that story? Yeah, you bet. It's a, it's a fascinating story. So he was at Reed College in Portland. Um, he can't find, he, can't, he, he doesn't see the point of his education. He drops out. He's wandering around campus. He's looking at posters on campus. They're all done in this calligraphy hand, and that draws his curiosity. And somebody says, oh, we have a good program in calligraphy. He takes the program. He comes to cultivate this aesthetic sense. He then begins to insist on um, proportional fonts for his, <coughs> excuse me, his uh, original computer at a time when, and then it took years and years before Microsoft caught up. But it was that um, accommodation of the aesthetic that meant that Mac 
would, uh, Macintosh could speak to the design community. And so they locked up that constituency who served as their kind of um, early testers and their passionate fans and their enthusiastic endorsers for a long time. And so it proved to be a, a, an important course to take. Now, we can't infer from that story that had that not happened, you know, we wouldn't have got Apple or it wouldn't have. No. But, but you can infer what from that? I think you can infer that, uh, well, he, that, he, the Apple proposition has always been we're about creativity. And Microsoft is all about business. But we're about, about uh, intellectual and, and creative innovation. I, I'm not sure you, you necessarily can make that proposition at work unless you make this special bond with the most creative professionals in North American culture. And that, and, and that feeling for the look and feel of text on the screen and indeed the larger kind of techn technological package that comes from the calligraphy experience. Now I wonder if one of the morals of that story is that whatever genius, as he puts it, he brings to what he does, he clearly didn't learn in a classroom. No. It clearly came from within. Yes. Is that a conclusion that you've come to having yeah. looked at what chief culture officers do? Yes. Well, yes, thank God he dropped out. That made me <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess w w we're now seeing, uh, liberal arts are great, and uh, liberal arts is just the kind of program somebody wants to take if they're preparing to be a chief culture officer. Um, business school is not so much. And I was teaching at the Harvard Business School. I would occasionally refer to contemporary culture, and the kids would look at me like, dude. And I'd say, so what's the matter with that? And they'd say, well, we understood that when we joined this business school, we were obliged now to forget about all the stuff we knew about culture and just get down to business, get down to thinking about the world according to these Smithian economics kind of point of view that just removes and forgets the social and the cultural. Students at Harvard really call you dude? <laughs> Occasionally. <laughs> they do. Yeah. They all deserve to fail. I mean, in our day, if you called your professor dude, yeah. it just didn't happen. <laughs> Well, if that's the case, is there good academic training you can get out there to be a chief culture officer? I think the Rotman School here is a magnificent kind of, uh, 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 well, the University of Toronto is a place to get a liberal arts education, is a great place to go to school, but then to take that second degree at the Rotman School at the University of Toronto is a great idea because, as we know, Roger Martin is, is embracing this idea of a liberal arts approach to business and trying to combine the analytical and the intuitive and cultivate what, what he calls this uh, opposable mind and integrative thinking. So it's, that's, it's, you know, it's world class. I know totally. Canadians always think <clears throat> that they, I shouldn't say always, I mean there, there's a lot of Canadians who think they have a special insight into the American culture because we are so inundated by it yeah. but we don't totally. kind of live there. Totally. You buy into that? I do. I, I, you know, somebody, an American journalist asked uh, Martin Short why it was so many comedians in the States are Canadian. He said, well you grew up watching uh, TV. I grew up uh, in Canada watching American TV. So it's always that slight remove. So we're, we're participants, certainly, but we're also observers. And I think that's critical for, to cultivate a feeling. And you look at you know, Canadians' contribution, feeling for where culture meets commerce. And it's everywhere. There. It's in Innes, and it's in McLuhan, it's Zneimer, it's uh, TVO. It's, you know, it's everywhere you look. Canadians, go to, the joke is that there are a million Canadians living in California, all of them working for industrial light and magic. <laughs> We're just very good at, at, at culture and commerce. Hmm. Uh, here's a great example, the Ford example. A mm. hundred people <clears throat> from across the United States uh, given a Ford Fiesta for six months, a 2011 Ford Fiesta, so right. we're talking next year's model. Each person given monthly missions to post online what they think, and right. they can make productions, I guess, for YouTube and upload it and all that. Uh, we're going to play a little of that video, then we'll come right. back and talk. Roll tape, please. Oh, I know my life just sounds so fun, but it's nothing without my Ford Fiesta. Hey guys, how's it going? This is the Mystery Guitar Man. Hey girl. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. I just got my first mission. And it is to drive until I run out of gas. No, no, it's a, it's a Ford Fiesta. Fiesta? Yeah. Remember that this car gets anywhere from 30 to 40 miles a gallon? I guess be anywhere from Rochester, New York to halfway to Canada. And we shall see where we end up. Now, I know you like that effort. What, what do you think is so brilliant about it? Mm. It makes good on the new contract in marketing. The old contract of marketing said you load up the cannons, you come up with a very simple message, you say it as loudly as you can, as often as you can, until the dimmest person in the world understands that, say, a Ford Fiesta stands for excellence in engineering or something. The new contract in marketing says mm, that's just 
irritating for everyone. Um, what we want instead is something closer to a conversation. Um, and the buzzword that people are now using is this notion of co-creation that says if you want a, 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 a vital animated brand, you want to bring in people like this guy um, in the spot we just saw uh, to help create that uh, brand, um, to co-create the brand. And so what you do is send them off. What you know about them to begin with is that they are, as many people are now, creating content online, putting things on YouTube and blogging and Twittering and so on. Um, and so you say, well, well, why don't we give them assignments and give them a car and, and, and encourage them to participate in the world using this fiesta and in the process to help create this notion of what a, fiesta, a Ford Fiesta can be. So it's an example of the social media put to a, a commercial purpose, but it has kind of interesting and charming uh, cultural effects. It and, seems to have authenticity in the way that another you know, typical commercial wouldn't have. Right. Uh, but is that, is that really there, or am I just buying into something, and yeah. if a really more cynical observer would say, ah, you just got suckered in for something that's the yeah. same, it's just... Yeah. You know. See, I don't think... The new model says suckering is impossible. It probably never worked in the old days, but now it just doesn't work, because everybody's so sophisticated from a media point of view, they look at what you're doing and see right through it. So they either say, mm, this, this uh, sending off people to drive their cars until they run out of gas, that's charming and interesting, or, or they don't. Don't, but they make their choice. But it, they're much closer now to creating a, an, uh, a companionable brand as opposed to this kind of blowhard bully of, of the old regime. And I guess as well, I mean, the appeal to the younger generation is obvious here if you're involved in social media and right. all that kind of thing. Totally. Is that the future? I think so. Ab absolutely right. So now it's possible to engage people in this very particular way and then dr you know, deliver that message to people in a, in a very particular way. So it's the end of mass marketing, effectively. Hmm. Is that a bad thing? Um, is mass marketing a bad thing no, or the, the end of? The end of mass marketing. I mean, if you're, uh, I'm imagining if you're trying to sell a product, mm. you talk about Coke in your book, mm. to a vast, you know, array of people, you kind of can't do it. The, can, can you still do it the old-fashioned way, the mass marketing way? Yeah, no, I don't think so. And that's, mm. we occasionally will see ads on, on TV of, uh, that come from the old regime, and it's just so painful, you know. And, mm. and unless they're ridiculous, as they are in the case of, you know, slankets and snuggy blankets and so on, then those are charming. But otherwise, it's just like, a, you know, everyone is, uh, you know, impatient beyond words. I, I want you to, <clears throat> just finally here, help us understand what it must be like trying to market to this new generation mm. when, I guess, in our day and in previous generations, I think the quote in your book was, you're either, you know, James Dean, mm. not the sausage guy, but the rebel right. without a cause. You're either James Dean or you're your, par your parents. Right. Whereas today, you are 50 different, yeah. whatever, identifiable groups. Right. You're not just in or out. You're yeah. 50 different things. Totally. How do you sell to them? Uh, I guess you want brands that are as versatile and various and multiple and messy as, as they are. And a chief culture officer has got to be able to figure all that out? Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a bit of an undertaking, but you know, over the short term, I think it's possible to, to make the brand companionable and interesting and, and um, you know, welcome presence in our culture, because otherwise, you know, the alternative is this blowhard model, and no one wants that. Those days are done. I think so. Okay. Grant McCracken, it's good of you to join us today. Chief Culture Officer is the name of the new book. Thanks Thank so you, much. Steve. Thank you, Steve.